Right, assalamualaikum and good morning, everyone. So today we're going to resume our lecture uh, on LU6, uh, which is the last two uh, topic. Okay, so we have another one uh, next week, inshallah. So the sixth topic is downstream processing and purification of products. If let's say anything unclear in the middle of the lectures, just stop me any time. Eh? Right, so let's recap what we have learned in this course so far. So previously we talked about fermentation a lot. Yeah, uh, We talked about the introduction to fermentation and then the media formulation, yeah, media is food for the microbes when we grow it during the fermentation. But then we talk about uh, the platform for the uh, fermentation, which is called biorector or fermenter, is the same thing, right? And then we talk about uh, animal and plant biorectors. Uh, biorectors for microorganisms and also the biorectors for the animal and plant cultures. And then uh, solid state fermentations, yeah, last week. Is it last week? Oh, last week, yes. Last two weeks. And then uh, uh, in the recorded lectures, you guys might have uh, watched the video on the rapid fermentation uh, process development, yeah, which is that we're still in fermentation. And this topic is, uh, is, sorry, it's not the six LU. I thought I, I, I told just not six, right? It's the seven LU, downstream processing and purification of product. The six LU is rapid fermentation process development. Yeah? So this today's topic is the seven topic. Yeah? Right. Uh, so previously, all those fermentation related topics, they are under upstream processing. So bioprocess in general is divided into two main uh, fields or areas. Uh, the first one is upstream processing. Upstream processing deals with the production, with the fermentation process, basically. Uh, so all of those topics that we have discussed before, uh, they are under upstream processing because it's related to fermentation. So after the fermentation, so fermentation is actually the production process, right? Uh, is the production uh, of whatsoever the bioproducts that you want to produce by cultivating the microorganisms. Uh, so after the fermentation process ends, uh, there is a stage whereby we want to recover or we want to harvest uh, the products. Yeah. So let's say this one is the biorector. Yeah. Imagine this is the biorector. You start the fermentation and your uh, cells grow, right, according to the the phases, the log phase, the stationary, uh, the log, black log, and stationary, and after that, uh, it reached the death phase. Um, you know, regardless of the type, uh, it can be bacteria, yeast, fungi, animal, or plant. After all of those uh, stages end, right? You want to get the products because that is the the aim of the fermentation. You want to produce the products and you need to harvest the products at the end. You don't want the products to sit in the biorector just like that. Yeah? Uh, so you have to take it out and you have to uh, purify it, separate and purify it. Because uh, once the fermentation takes place, uh, the, micro, uh, the organisms, uh, they would produce lots of stuff apart from your product of interest. Of course, your product of interest will be the main product, right? But apart from that, there are other byproducts. Byproducts means those products that are produced in little amount. Uh, so the main products, uh, the one that is produced in uh, the, the most uh, amount of uh, the, the main, the highest amount, okay? Uh, so that is the main product. The byproducts, those are co-products, co-products, little amount. So you need to separate your main product from uh, all of those other uh, co-products eh? because at the end, if you want to market the stuff, whatever the product is, like the pharmaceutical or the drugs or the fuel, you might you you uh, you want it to be in the highest purity uh, possible, right? 
you want to get it like for example if your product is uh, bioethanol at the end you want to get like all of them are bioethanol the purity is like let's say 99 percent of course 100 percent is not uh, always the case but uh, 98 99 percent or 95 percent and above the purity means that it's totally uh, th that product that particular product is totally bioethanol it doesn't have other impurities so in order to reach that uh, level purity the highest the higher the purity uh, the better right because you you are sure that it doesn't have other things uh, but it has to undergo several stages so that is where uh, downstream processing uh, comes into play after the upstream processing ends after the upstream processes end uh, there should be another stage whereby uh, the broth after the fermentation, we have the broth. Uh, so now we are talking about submerged fermentation eh? because in the industry, uh, submerged fermentation is uh, always preferred over solid state. Yeah. So now uh, our fermentation broth here is in liquid state, in culture broth. We call it broth. Eh? Broth is contain, uh, broth, broth contains uh, the residual media and also the cells. So you want to you have to do something on the broth. Eh? So after the fermentation ends. You, uh, if let's say you are working in a company, uh, there is a upstream or fermentation unit and there is a downstream processing unit. So the fermentation unit will pass the broth to the downstream processing unit for the, 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 for the staff over there to convert the things into uh, end product, which has the uh, high purity of the product of interest okay so the downstream processing basically is a stage after the fermentation after the upstream processing where um, it aims to separate and purify the products so that at the end the products can be marketed it can be uh, delivered to the uh, consumers okay right so today's topic is about this stage uh, downstream this part yeah whereby after the fermentation you we get the, the broth and we process it. So there are several stages, uh, different methods, uh, depending on the types of the product um, that can be uh, carried out during uh, the whole process of uh, downstream processing, okay? So today's topic will be, uh, we, we will have a look at what is downstream processing, some introduction, and the general processing of cell products Whenever I say cell products here, it, it is in general, it can cover all bacteria, yeast, fungi, animal, or plant cells. Yeah. So it's, uh, we are talking about the broad concept. So there are two types of uh, products, uh, whether it is intracellular or extracellular. Intracellular means inside, it is produced inside the cells. Extracellular means it is produced outside the cell. Yeah? And then uh, we're going to have a look at what are the stages of downstream processing. So what we have to do once we get the fermentation growth, uh, what are the steps? Because there are uh, a series of steps that we have to perform in order to find, in order to get the final uh, product, which is in the purified form. And then after that, we, uh, the, the last stage is the marketing, the marketing of the products. So those are the subtopics that we are going to look at today. Okay. So I've mentioned just now, uh, the focus of this lecture will be on the product recovery from submerged fermentation or from liquid fermentation, not from solid state fermentation. Uh, Processing is one of the most essential steps in the bioprocess industry. Bioprocess is it covers both uh, upstream and downstream. So without good uh, designs of the processes under the downstream processing, uh, whatever that you fermented, whatever you produce during the fermentation will be meaningless, will be pointless. Because uh, no matter how good the production is, if let's say the harvesting stage is uh, not good, at the end, you will not get your product in uh, the highest purity form, right? So it's a 
it, it is equally important as the fermentation process. Um, so I can say that it's 50-50, 50% of the whole process goes to the uh, fermentation or the upstream and 50% of the importance uh, goes to the downstream. So it is as important as the fermentation or as the upstream process. Yeah? Uh, it incurs one of the highest expenses in the bioprocess industry, which is about 40 to 50% of the total cost, yeah? uh, whereas the rest goes to the production or the fermentation. Uh, it requires several steps to fish out the wanted product from the growth. Yeah? As I said just now, they are the, our, the, the product of interest might be mixed with other things that we do not want, so we need to get it and separate it from the rest of the um, content. Yeah? Uh, the product may be fragile, fragile in terms of the heat or pH sensitive, or uh, and or in diluted form. Yeah? So the nature of the product is different from one to another. It can be some products are sensitive to heat, some are not, some are sensitive to pH, some are sensitive to perhaps um, uh, oxygen, yeah? and some are in concentrated form, some in diluted form, some in intermediate form. Yeah? So uh, the type of the nature of the products, it may uh, determine uh, the cost of the product because uh, in order for you, let's say, to keep the things in without uh, at, at certain temperature, perhaps it is uh, heat sensitive. So you must need certain incubators, certain processes that have that sort of uh, criteria, that sort of environment. So those contribute to the cost of the production uh, at the end. Yeah? The price of the product depends on the yield, the concentration, and the market values. So the product in general, it can be divided into uh, critical products or non-critical products or less critical products. For example, pharmaceutical products, uh, those that are to be consumed uh, as medicine, they are critical products and they are, they, they are actually as, uh, expensive eh? because the, the measures taken is uh, more compared to the non-critical products. Eh? For example, citric acid, uh, it can produce at 100 gram per liter, uh, and the price is between 1 to 2 USD per kilogram. Uh, 1 to 2 USD per kilogram. And citric acid is considered as uh, a non-critical product. Uh, and that, what I mean by non-critical product is like, uh, it is not as sensitive as those pharmaceutical eh, or therapeutic protein. So, uh, so in contrast, therapeutic protein, Produced at 0 0.000001 gram per liter. So the concentration is small, but uh, with that little concentration, the cost is very expensive. It's about 100 million USD per kilogram compared to citric acid just now, which is just one to two. So it's 100 million uh, fold, yeah? more expensive. So that is the comparison. This is just a uh, two comparison, but there are actually a lot of other products that have different range, a different concentration and a different price. Yeah? Okay, so whenever we start the fermentation, uh, this is just to give you a picture about the growth that, uh, that is going to be passed to the downstream processing uh, section. Yeah? So when we start the fermentation, we have this fresh media. So you will see that it is clear, uh, the, the solution is clear because we don't add the microbes yet and there's no fermentation yet happening. So this, this is how the fresh media looks like before the fermentation. And after the fermentation, uh, it will turn cloudy. This uh, clear media will turn cloudy like this. So this is what we normally term as culture growth culture growth, and growth is uh, normally in liquid, and it does not only consist liquid, but actually it comprises of solids, uh, which is which are cells, yeah? because after we put the seed culture into this, uh, the seed culture multiply, yeah? the, the cells multiply, and it will produce, it will grow, right? It will uh, grow in size and grow in number, uh, and it will produce the products. So at the end, uh, the culture growth looks like cloudy uh, and it is not totally liquid because it, already, it also has solids. But of course you see that in general, 
uh, superficially, like uh, on the surface, you see it is still liquid, but because we don't see the cells, uh, they are small in size. Uh, if you centrifuge this, you will get pellets and superdentin. Yeah? Uh, so that shows that it has some amount of uh, solids. Right, so this is the uh, how the culture growth looks like after the fermentation, generally. Yeah? Uh, so it looks like uh, this. And this is the one that you're going to process uh, under the downstream processing uh, section. Yeah. Right. So the types of the cell products, um, it, it can be divided into two main types, uh, whether it's intracellular products or extracellular products. Yeah? So intra is produced inside the cells. Sorry. Intracellular, it, uh, the products are produced inside the cells, whereas extracellular, they are produced outside the cells. So if let's say just now you have uh, the broth, it has a uh, solid portion and liquid portion. Uh, if let's say the products are intracellular products, they actually, they are actually reside inside the, the solid part. Okay. Uh, but if they are extracellular, they are Outside the cells means they are in the liquid. So uh, the knowledge about whether your products are extracellular or intracellular is very, very important because it will determine uh, the steps that you would take during the downstream processing. Okay, so the whole thing here, if you see this diagram, the whole thing here is uh, the processes or the stages of downstream processing. So it does not only uh, comprise of a single step, okay? Because the process of separating and purifying it uh, is tedious, so it needs several stages. Uh, so uh, the the what I said just now, the knowledge of the intracellular or extracellular is important because if let's say your product is intracellular, but you do not know you you uh, you might be mistaken, right? You take the liquid, so at the end you will not get anything because you are targeting the wrong portion, right? And the other way around, if your product is in the liquid, but you attack the solid and you discard the liquid after uh, the separation here, uh, after let's say the sanctification. So at the end, you will not get your product. So that's why it's very, very important for you to know where is your product. And that is the first uh, step and the prerequisite for uh, downstream, for any downstream processing. Um, so if you see here, right, I just go uh, briefly, after this I will go in detail. Uh, is it everything clear, guys? Yes, yes? okay, thank you. So you can see that the difference, uh, if let's say the, uh, the products are produced intracellularly, so the steps will be different. So of course, first you have to disrupt the cells because the products are inside the cells. And then uh, once the cells are disrupted, you have to collect the liquid and then you have to proceed with the primary separation. And after that, uh, this one will divide it into further into solid and liquid, and you will get the liquid and you proceed with the final purification, right? And finally, it would be the product drying, conditioning and uh, stabilization and marketing. But if let's say the product are produced intra, uh, extracellularly, so you don't actually uh, care about the solid. Means that after, let's say here, after this step, primary solid liquid separation, uh, in the lab, we normally adopt centrifugation. So you will get pellet and supernatant. So liquid is the supernatant, solid is the pellet. Uh, so after the centrifugation, if your product is extracellular, so you will take care of the liquid. You discard the solid, right? And you proceed with the primary separation where you further separate if there are remaining solids in the liquid from here, uh, you will remove it during the primary separation and you get the liquid, proceed with the purification and drying and uh, conditioning and stabilization. So that's why it's very important to know where your product is, eh? otherwise you would target this, the wrong portion. 
Now, uh, this is just to show you, yeah, again, extra, uh, extracellular, intracellular. And apart from it, it can be, the product can be the biomass itself. Right? Remember in the first uh, LV, we talked about the types of products. It can be uh, the cells that we want to harvest or the products, uh, whether it's intracellular or extracellular. So the biomass, um, uh, the examples is spirulina cells because people want to get the spirulina it's a not, uh, I mean, it doesn't, the, the, it's not about the products, but it's about the biomass itself. Eh? So, so other products, uh, they fall into under extracellular or intracellular category. Uh, example of extracellular uh, products are ethanol, lactic acid. Eh? Uh, so these are some examples. There are more actually. Intracellular, uh, for example, antibiotic lipid yeah so uh, some enzymes also they are produced intracellular intracellularly so if you are doing fermentation uh those for you are doing fyp please make sure that you know uh, what is your product uh, the nature of your product whether they are extracellular or intracellular so in extracellular just now it's like it's produced outside lah. In, intracellularly the dalam is produced inside the cells uh, which is actually more uh, complicated if it is produced intracellularly because you have to break the cells in order to get the products. Okay, now let's have a look at what are the stages of the downstream processing. Okay, so this is actually uh, covers the same uh, diagram here. Just repeat the same thing. So here we're going to have a look at each of the stages uh, in detail. So here is uh, the picture at the industry where uh, after the fermentation, the culture grows. Sorry, I forgot to explain about this diagram. Okay, so uh, this diagram shows that uh, after the fermentation, yeah, after the fermentation, uh, what are the composition of the the composition of the growth? Uh, please refer to this. Uh, Chai, uh, chai, chai, eh? chai, 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 eh? right. Um, normally the product will, uh, uh, the product of interest will be just actually 10% of the culture growth. Whereas you can see that uh, the biggest portion is water, 88%. And there are also other products like byproducts or other impurities, uh, which present in a small amount like 1%. Or zero point or less than one percent. So you can see that here, the product is very little, and we have to get rid of the water, uh, which constitutes the major portion of the growth. So that uh, removal of water is the one that we are going to uh, go through for every stage uh, during the downstream processing yeah? during the. Primary solid aqueous separation, cell destruction, until finally you get the final purification stage. Yeah? So that is uh, about the composition. All right. Uh, so let's have a look at first how to uh, process intracellular products. Yeah. So let's let's focus on the intracellular products first. So once uh, the fermentation is completed. The growth will be uh, will undergo uh, what we call conditioning. So conditioning is a stage whereby you uh, perhaps prepare the growth for the DSP. DSP is downstream processing. Normally we denote it as DSP. Yeah? So growth conditioning, uh, the growth will be stored uh, in certain tanks, and it will be uh, treated with certain uh, chemicals in order to perhaps prepare it for the primary solid liquid separation, okay? So, and at that stage also, the pH is uh, is uh, set to the uh, optimal pH. The temperature is set at certain temperature so that the, the growth will not be degraded, yeah? So that is the purpose of conditioning. And then it will pass to the primary solid uh, liquid separation. And then after that, you will only consider the solid and you discard the liquid because your product is in the solid. The solid here refers to the cells. Yeah? So after that will be the cell disruption stage. 
cell destruction means you break the cells, right? So basically you break the cell wall in order to get the content inside. And the content inside what we call lysate because we lyse the cell, we break the cells and the content uh, inside is called lysate, the cell lysate. So cell lysate means the content of the cell after the disruption. So after the disruption, the reason why you will consider liquid is because uh, the content inside the cells, they are actually in liquid nature, in liquid state. So whatever the things that are present in solid after the cell disruption, those are the cell debris. So that uh, all those things that you break, you know, like the cell wall, the cell debris, uh, those are the solids. And you uh, you do not want that. You, you have to, this one is actually, um, normally after the cell disruption, you will centrifuge and the solid will be present in the form of pellets and liquid is a supernatant. So the solid will be discarded, okay? Uh, so if let's say uh, it is to be recycled, it will be uh, used as fertilizer because it consists of certain uh, leftover nutrients, yeah? But your product is here in the liquid. And then after that, uh, it undergoes primary separation. Primary separation is the early stage of purification. So here you, further separate whatever the solids that is not um, removed during this part here, it will be uh, separated during the primary separation. So that's why you can see after the primary separation, they are solid and liquid again. Yeah. So the solid will be discarded and you will proceed with this liquid again Yeah. because the, the product is in the liquid state. So this liquid state will undergo the final purification uh, so this is where the products will be uh, purified uh, to the highest purity, yeah? uh, normally using chromatography or solvent extraction. And after that, uh, the product will be dried, further dried, conditioned, and stabilized. So uh, the, uh, the drying here, it will remove whatever the water. So throughout the process here, actually, the water is discarded uh, gradually. Yeah, that amount of 80% water of the growth, yeah, it will be discarded until at the end you will get concentrated product uh, in the form of powder. Uh, so, uh, and also it has, it will be added with some stabilizer or conditioner in order to extend the chef life of the products. Yeah? And after that, it will be marketed. Okay, so that is intracellular products. For the extracellular products, uh, so once you once you uh, separate the solid and liquid, uh, okay, in the lab you normally apply the centrifugation. So you will get the pellets and the supernatant. This is after uh, the first stage, uh, the first um, separation. So you will keep the supernatant and you will discard the solid. So it's opposite to the intracellular products. So the solid will be, uh, if it is to be recycled, then it will be used as fertilizer. But if it's not, it's just discarded. So the liquid will be proceeded with the primary separation. Uh, and here, uh, the primary separation uh, is the same thing. It tries to uh, concentrate, uh, to further purify, uh, purify. So any remaining solids that is not removed during the first stage here, it will be removed here. So this solid will be discarded again, and you will proceed with the liquid, and you will proceed with the final purification, and before you got the end product. Yeah? So this is extracellular product. So uh, looking at the stages now, extracellular products are actually much easier uh, because it doesn't have the cell disruption process. So here, there is a cell disruption just now, right? Because you, you have to break the cell and you have to uh, get the things inside and you have to further purify it. So actually extracellular products are much easier to be dealt with yeah? uh, compared to the intracellular products. Uh, but you cannot choose um, what I mean by intracellular, extracellular, that is the nature of the product. Yeah? Uh, so you just have to be happy. Like if let's say your product is, is produced extracellularly, so you have to accept it and you have to you have to, uh, Mila, you have to follow the steps. Eh? So it's something that uh, out of our control, whether it's interested or extracellular. Okay. 
So the growth conditioning, the first step, okay, what happened during this step, right? So after the fermentation, the bioreactor is the place where we carry out the fermentation, right? So after the fermentation, the broth will be pumped into suitable tanks. Uh, this is happened in the industry. In the lab, we don't have this. Uh, so it will be pumped into the suitable tanks like this one, the picture below here. So that is where the fermentation broth is placed yeah, before the DSP. Uh, so in this uh, pump, uh, sorry, in this tank, uh, it will undergo conditioning. Conditioning ni macam try to make it uh, in a good state lah. Eh? Like uh, if you apply conditioner after you wash your hair again, so it's just to refine your hair. So it's it's to refine the uh, broth before uh, before the DSP. Okay, so conditioning is achieved by leaving the broth to stand to allow whatever fermentation reactions to be completed. So perhaps there might be residual uh, cells that still grow. So uh, somehow at certain point, they are fermentation, that uh, leftover fermentation, okay? But after a certain time, of course, uh, the fermentation will be uh, completed or will be ended, right? Uh, and, and during the conditioning, uh, preliminary separation uh, will also be uh, done, okay? This is by adding certain things, okay? It depends on the process or products. Right, so uh, during this stage, sedimentation means uh, whatever the solid will stay at the bottom of the tank, and the liquid will stay at the at um, at the the top side of the broth. Yeah? Um, so uh, conditioning is also achieved by adjusting various parameters like pH or temperature. So if let's say your product of interest, the pH is, the, the suitable pH is at certain pH, like pH 7. So during this uh, process or stage, uh, it's very important to maintain the pH at the right pH yeah, for so that the products will not be degraded. And as, uh, same as the temperature, if let's say the product is uh, to be maintained at certain temperature, right? So at this stage, the temperature needs to be controlled. Yeah, so that it will not degrade the products. Uh, improve sedimentation of the cells and stabilize the products by adding uh, chemical salts. So during this stage also, certain types of uh, chemicals might be added in order to promote the sedimentation. So uh, early sedimentation is uh, important because it will ease the next process, which is the primary solid liquid separation. Okay, so once the, the, the broth has been sedimented, so the, the next stage will be much easier compared to if, let's say, it is not sedimented yet, okay? So that is conditioning, uh, the stage before the downstream processing. Um, so the next stage is the primary solid liquid separation. So as the name implies, we want to separate the solid and the liquid. So what are the solid? The cells and the liquid is the residual media, okay? Uh, the components in a fermenter or the broth is heterogeneous. Heterogeneous means it's, it's not, it's opposite to homogeneous. Homogeneous is uniform throughout. Heterogeneous, it, it means that it has a mixture of things, uh, which is cells and also all the uh, media. Yeah? So the first step during the downstream processing is to separate the solid, which are cells, from the liquid which is uh, the media, actually, the residual media, and other things. Uh, it could be other impurities that may present uh, during the fermentation and needs to be separated. Solid liquid separation are usually considered as mechanical separation method. The degree of separation depends on whether the product is uh, biomass, which is very easy, extra, uh, extracellular, relatively easy, and intracellular, which is uh, very difficult. Yeah? Um, Cell removal, the bacteria or other drivers, is a capital intensive process step. Uh, so what are what are the unit operations involved? It can be filtration, uh, it can also be centrifugation. Okay, I think you are quite familiar with the concept of filtration and centrifugation. Uh, in the industry, there are other methods as well called flotation and sedimentation. Uh, we're gonna have a look at it later. 
So the results of this uh, stage will be liquid and solid. Yeah? So it will divide the growth into solid and liquid. Okay, so as I mentioned just now, like if your products, you have to know where your product sits. Yeah? Okay, so what are the, what are the possible methods? Uh, these are all the possible methods, flotation, sedimentation, centrifugation, and filtration. Okay, but I think these are the same points. And these are this how the broth looks like. Of course, you cannot see by naked eye, but what uh, reside in the broth are all those uh, solid in the um, the cells in the form of solid and the uh, liquid. Yeah. So this is actually what uh, this broth actually consists of. Yeah? Uh, so. In order to separate the solid and liquid, uh, these are the steps. Uh, these are the possible methods. What I what I mean by possible methods means uh, you can opt for centrifugation, you can opt for filtration, but at the end, uh, it will divide the broth into two. Okay. In order to choose which one is suitable, it depends on uh, the product. It depends on the process as well, and it depends on the broth uh, too. If let's say the uh, the broth is uh, very viscous. Viscous means uh, liquid, yeah? very concentrated uh, viscous. Um, filtration might not be suitable because it will block the filters. Yeah? Uh, and in that case, centrifugation is much better because it will, uh, you know, the, the formation of the pellets will be much easier compared to if, let's say, you want to remove the solids by using filters. Right. Okay. So let's have a look at each of this stage, flotation, sedimentation, Centrifugation and filtration. Uh, for the flotation, this one um, for biotech, uh, we don't really use this. I'm not sure. Normally, we don't use flotation. Uh, we normally use centrifugation, but perhaps this one could be applied in the industry. So, how this um, a method works? Flotation, as the name implies, flotation it will float the things, the solids on the surface. And how to float those solids is by adding certain uh, chemicals, which are surfactants. Yeah? So uh, certain chemicals will be added yeah, with high surface activities, such as long chain fatty acids, amines, ammonium compounds. So these are the components that will help uh, the flotation. Okay, So normally it's surfactant added. Yeah? Uh, so what happens is that when the surfactant are added in the broth, the, uh, the solids will be uh, promoted, will be triggered to be floated yeah, on the surface of the uh, broth. Yeah. So finally, it will, uh, it will be on the top of the surface and it, will be, it can be easily separated from the liquid at the bottom. Yeah. So that is flotation. Uh, the cells are induced to float using chemicals which are normally surfactants so the surfactants have all these long chain fatty acid amines or ammonium compounds that help to uh, to raise the cells to float okay that is flotation uh, sedimentation is opposite to flotation so if flotation it triggers the cells or the solids to float on the surface sedimentation it uh, triggers the cells to sediment at the bottom. Sediment means it will reach, it will form a uh, uh, solid portion at the bottom. Yeah, right. For example, here, if you see this one, this one is the sediment, yeah? the solid portion. Right. So, how to trigger the broth or the solids to sediment is by adding certain types of chemicals which are different from flotation. Yeah? So the chemicals are salt, organic solvent, non-ionic polymers, polyelectrolyte, uh, protein binding dyes, and affinity precipitants. So these chemicals can trigger the cells to sediment at the bottom of the uh, flask. Eh? Right, so flotation that is surfactants. So that's the difference. Right. Uh, apart from adding chemicals, we can also adjust the pH. So certain reaction may trigger the uh, solids to sediment at the bottom. Right. Okay. So it's, that is sedimentation. So after the sedimentation end, you can easily collect the liquid 
and uh, the, the solid at the bottom. Okay. So the purpose is actually to separate the two portions. Eh? So that is sedimentation. Right. So this is uh, how the sedimentation is applied in the industry. So you can see the scale here is uh, very deep. Yeah. Uh, and it is suitable because if let's say you want to centrifuge large amount of this uh, kind of liquid, it might be uh, costly or it might not be suitable. Uh, but so in that case, sedimentation is adopted yeah, in order to separate the solid and liquid. Okay, I think this one is the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it shows the sedimentation of the solids at the bottom. Right, so this is how it looks like, these machines. Uh, and this is, the process is, um, is, is actually the mixing is taking place in order to promote things to be sedimented. Yeah? So it is in, uh, in uh, circular motion, actually, this, this equipment. Yeah? Okay, so that is sedimentation. Uh, the third type of method to separate the solid from the liquid is centrifugation. Okay, this is a very common uh, method to be used in the lab because it is very easy, very simple, and we can have uh, the small centrifuge in order to uh, to separate a small amount of growth. Yeah? So it's very practical in the lab, so that's why we use it. Right, centrifugation is a method that separates the particles or solid in suspension by using centrifugal force. Uh, so that is the mechanism. Uh, so the products or the particles are separated based on the density. So the one that is heavy or with high density, it will sediment at the bottom, right? It will sit at the bottom uh, and it will present as a pellet, uh, as a pellet. So we call it pellet for the products of the centrifugation, the pellet and the supernatant. Supernatant is the liquid portion. Yeah? Um, so the growth is subjected to centrifugal force, denser particles sediment faster than lighter particles under the effect of centrifugal forces. So this is example of centrifuge in the lab. There are various sizes of centrifuge, uh, the one that can accommodate the tube right, the Eppendorf uh, tube, or the larger one is uh, the one that can accommodate the falcon tube, the 15 mil and the 15 mil of falcon tubes. So there are different types of centrifuge. Um, so I want to ask you guys, uh, have you guys used centrifuge before? Yes. Okay, what is... What is the most important thing that you have to know about centrifuge? It has to be opposite to each other. It has to be? Opposite to each other, doctor. Opposite to each other. So what does it mean, opposite to each other? Stability. Oh, okay, balance. Okay, that's the word. Yeah, stable. It should be stable, but then uh, the, the, the most Correct one is balance. Lah. We want to make sure that the stability is balanced. Yeah? Right. Okay, so this is a very important knowledge yeah, before you use centrifuge because you guys are going to use centrifuge a lot in the lab later for your FYP. And I don't want you guys to break the centrifuge because it might affect not just your work, but other works. Yeah? And the cost of the maintenance is not cheap uh, and not just the cost. It might take some time. Uh, so that's why it's very, very important for you to make sure that your samples inside the centrifuge is balanced. What is meant by balance means you have to put it like uh, opposite, like your friend said just now, opposite. It, it's fine if, let's say, you don't use all the holes or the places inside. If, let's say, you want to centrifuge just two, two tubes, it's fine. But as long as it is balanced, you put it like opposite to each other. And when I say balance, it's not just about having the uh, tubes or the, uh, the yeah, having the tubes uh, opposite, but the volume of the tubes must be the same. It must be of the same type first, the tubes, because for the centrifuge tubes, there are two milliliter tubes and one and a half 
meal tube, right? So the shape is different, the weight is different. Yeah. So in order for you to apply the tubes in the centrifuge, the type must be the same because it will affect the weight and also the volume of the things that you put inside the tubes must be the same. If let's say you are using a two milliliter tube, but you add one milliliter of uh, broth, for example, inside, Another one, the one that you balance, the one that you put uh, opposite to it, it must also have one milliliter of liquid or a uh, broth, the same. Yeah. So balancing is not just about having the tubes, but also the volume inside and the type of the tubes that you use. Okay. So it's a very important uh, knowledge before you uh, use the centrifuge in the lab, yeah? because uh, you're going to use it a lot and don't try the error. Maybe you want to say, what happened if it's not balanced? Uh, never try that eh? because uh, our equipments are very limited and the maintenance is uh, it's not easy. Yeah? Okay? So please make sure you remember about it. Eh? This is not just for bioprocess, but it's a, it's a general knowledge in the lab, eh? centrifuge. Okay, uh, back to here. Uh, centrifuge are only used in downstream processing when Filtration is slow and difficult. Uh, the product which we are interested in must be obtained free from filter aids and continuous separation to a high standard of hygiene is required. Okay, so uh, just now when, when I say a list of methods of uh, primary solid liquid separation, uh, apart from the sedimentation filtration, uh, filtration is another one, right? So how to know whether, if let's say you want to separate your broth, whether it's centrifugation or filtration. Actually, in general, both work, but it depends on the type of your product. It depends on uh, your broth, whether your broth, what, what kind of broth you are having. If, is it viscous or not? If it is not viscous, um, and uh, if, it's, if it's not viscous, it is better to use centrifugation because uh, filtration might be more costly, more expensive than certification because you have to incur the cost of filter. Yeah? The filter is the cost. But for the centrifugation, uh, the machine is there. You can just centrifuge. I mean, it doesn't incur that really much cost, unlike filtration. Okay, uh, So that is one of the advantages of centrifugation over filtration. And filtration can be slow and difficult as well because... Uh, the things after this, we're going to look at the filtration. But in general, if you think about the filter, once the filter is uh, is full of the, uh, the the solids or the things that you want to filter, it will be blocked, right? And uh, towards the end, it might not be as efficient as in the beginning. So it will be much slower at the end and more difficult, right? So in that case, a centrifugation is much faster. Yeah, because you just centrifuge and you get the things directly. You don't have to incur uh, the risk of the block filter. Okay, so that's why centrifugation is uh, more preferable in that sense. Okay? And another reason is when the product of interest must be obtained free from filter aids. So when you filter, you pass the broth uh, through the filter, right? It means that uh, your product of interest perhaps might be mixed with the filter aid. The filter aid is the one that is inside the filter. So if let's say you, you do not want such thing, you do not want your products to be mixed with other things, so centrifugation is uh, more suitable. Okay, But if let's say it's fine, it doesn't have any problem, if let's say you uh, mix it with the filter aid when it passes through, uh, so filtration might be okay, might be fine. Yeah. So the selection, it depends on your product of interest. And also this one, high standard of hygiene, uh, is because when you centrifuge, perhaps you don't mix the things, Yeah. the things are, keep, are kept intact in the tube, it doesn't mix with the filter aids, so the hygiene or the sterility can be maintained if you are using centrifugation. Okay, so that's the the advantages of the centrifugation over filtration, and that's why it is more common uh, than filtration huh? in the lab. Okay, let's have a look at the types of centrifugation. Uh, there are differential centrifugation and... Okay, there are two types of centrifugation. 
the first type is what we call a differential centrifugation. So this is what you commonly see uh, after you centrifuge, you get the pellet and supernatin. Uh, this is called cent differential because it, it, um, it's just like two forms of things. Eh? Um, it's the most common method, separation of particles between pellets and supernatin. Pellet is a mixture of sediment sedimenting components. Supernatin contains the purified components. Uh, the larger particles will sediment first, leaving a mixture of the smaller particles which are slower. And the process can be repeated if further refining or removal of the particles are needed. Okay, this is uh, the normal centrifugation process. Huh? Right. So after, what is meant by the last statement here? It can be repeated. So let's say once you centrifuge, you will get the pellet, you will get this, the supernatant, right? And let's say you you are interested with the with the liquid and you want to get rid of the pellets. So you can transfer the liquid into a new tube, right? Into a new tube and you can centrifuge it again in order to refine, in order to uh, remove any residual solid that might present in the liquid, in the first liquid. So after the second centrifugation, you will get maybe perhaps little pellets, right? Uh, so those are the things that are actually uh, not palleted during the first centrifugation. So that is meant by uh, refining or further refining. And what affects the centrifugation is also the speed, right? So when you uh, when you use the centrifuge machine, uh, you will set certain speed. Uh, the speed is in terms of G, uh, gravity or RPM, revolution per minute. Yeah? So that's the unit for the speed. So uh, it depends, on, it depends on what speed that you are. Normally it's like uh, 400 RPM for a small centrifuge or the large one could be 10,000 RPM. Yeah? So that would affect the quality of the centrifugation. Okay. The second type of centrifugation is a uh, zonal centrifugation or zone velocity centrifugation. So what happened here is that uh, you have to add certain um stabilizer yeah uh, for example sucrose so these are your samples to be separated right so in the tube you put the sucrose uh, the stabilizer first and then the samples to be uh, separated your broth yeah for example your fermentation broth uh, and then you start the uh, start the centrifugation so once the centrifugation is done uh different particles will exist in different layers yeah, in different zones. So that's why it's called a zonal centrifugation. So it will ease actually the removal or separation of certain particles. Yeah? Uh, so the most dense, the most, the heaviest particle will sit at the bottom. Yeah, it's the same concept, the bottom and then followed by the last one and the lightest one at the top, okay? Uh, so this is what we call zonal centrifugation. Right, so perhaps this might be uh, common in chemistry for separation of certain uh, particles, yeah? but for fermentation growth, it's not that really common. We use the first one, the first type, yeah? we just centrifuge and get pellet and supernatant. Okay, the types of centrifuge. Okay, centrifugation is a process. Uh, the one that you see in the lab is lab scale centrifuge. It's the same thing like bioreactor. They are small bioreactor, large bioreactor. For the centrifuge also, they are small scale centrifuge. They are large scale centrifuge, pilot scale centrifuge. Uh, for the factories, they have bigger, not the one that is in our lab, yeah? because they have a large volume of growth to be centrifuge. So there are many types of centrifuge. So these are certain several types of centrifuge uh, used in downstream processing. Uh, the first one here is basket centrifuge. It looks like a basket, right? So this is the internal interior part of it. Yeah. So the broth will be placed inside this actually, and it will be rotated. Yeah. The, the, uh, the concept is the same. It's still rotated, uh, separating it based on the particles, but it's just the size and the design is different. Yeah. So this one is tubular ball centrifuge, right? So it looks like a cylindrical shape yeah, instead of basket, right? So that's a tubular ball centrifuge. 
right? So the things will be uh, re reside here, the growth huh? will be put inside this tubular bowl. Right. Advantages of centrifugation over filtration, uh, fully continuous processing, right? Large capacity in small equipment, short resident time, steam sterilizable equipment, the things here, this, this thing actually, it can be sterilized. So after each run, you want to get rid of any impurities inside, you can clean and you can uh, sterilize it using steam. Yeah? But for the filter, filtration, because filtration it depends on filters. So that filter is actually to be disposed. It's not like this one. This one, uh, the maintenance might not be as expensive as the filtration. Yeah? Fully automatic operation. So those are the advantages of centrifugation over filtration. Right. So any question on sanctification before we move to filtration? Are you guys still with me? Yes. No question. Okay. Right. Let's move to the filtration. Right. Filtration is another method that can be used in order to separate solid and liquid. Right, so this is a normal setup, uh, filtration setup that you might see before. Yeah, filter paper. This is the simplest, uh, not the the one that is going to be, uh, practiced in all situation. Okay, this one untuk ni lah, untuk filter yang senang senang je, the easy kind of uh particles, yeah, not viscous. So this one is. This is uh filter paper is is the one that you in order to filter the things right this one is uh where you add filter paper is uh, it can present in terms of a uh, small size so this one yang, the one with this uh funnel uh, this one is not a funnel uh, yeah funnel this is funnel actually different types of funnel this one is a v shape uh the filter paper here is smaller than this one yeah so dear dekat tengah tengah actually uh and you put the things to be filtered or the solution into this and the one that will go through yeah, that will filter will be called filtrate right the one that uh, kalau yang the one that is retented on the filter paper is called retented retented yeah? so there are those terms used in filtration so uh the filtration it can be for this one uh, this is a lab scale filtration it can be fastened by this one, it doesn't have any uh, vacuum yeah, for the first picture here. So it depends on the gravity the force. Okay? But for the this one, if you see this um, uh, this channel, it, it can be connected to the vacuum pump. So the, the second picture sh uh, here shows the tube that is actually be connected to the vacuum pump. So it will fasten the filtration process because once you uh, switch on the vacuum pump, it will suck the things, right? So the things inside here will be sucked by the vacuum and it will, uh, it will, it will speed up the filtration process. Sorry for this one. Okay. It will speed up the filtration process. Eh? But this one is when you do a uh, small scale of a uh, small volume of uh, things to be filtered. Okay. Right, let's have a look at the principle. The filterability of a fermentation broth depends on the type of broth and medium, uh, which means the particle size, the viscosity, on, and also the cell type. Okay, now we are talking about fermentation broth, eh? so not other solution. Uh, so if let's say the broth is viscous, uh, perhaps if you want still to do filtration um the filtration process might be slower yeah, because uh, the the filter might be blocked and perhaps you need to change the filter in the middle of the filtration in order to uh, speed up the filtration process and the cell type uh if let's say um the size if let's say your fermentation growth is from bacterial fermentation so the you have to know that the size of the uh, bacterial cell, which is normally 0 0.2 micrometer, okay, that is the smallest size of bacteria. So if let's say you want to retain 
the bacteria cell on the on the filter paper, you must take into consideration the pore size of the filter that you want to uh, use, uh, the filter paper that you want to use. So it must be less than 0 0.2 micrometer so that your bacteria will be will not flow through. Understand? So if let's say the pore size, the filter paper need the other pore size. If let's say the pore size is less than uh, is smaller than the bacteria, meaning that the bacteria cannot go through, then the bacteria cell will be retented on uh, the surface uh, on the filter paper. But if let's say your filter paper is 0 0.6 micrometer, your bacteria the bacteria is 0 0.2. So of course it will go through the filter paper and you will also collect the bacteria in your liquid. Means that there is no filtration, maybe uh, filtration of other things that is uh, greater than 0 0.6. Yeah. So the the size of the uh, for the pore size plays a very important role. So that's why you have to know your cell type, whether it's a bacteria, whether it's a yeast, or whether it's fungi. Okay, uh, because different uh, filter paper it comes with different pore size. Yeah? And filterability also depends on the fermentation time, right? Uh, it depends on when you your samples do. Is is it from is it harvested during the log phase? With uh, is it harvested during the stationary phase? Yeah. Uh, because during the analysis, you have to analyze different uh, samples taken at different time intervals. So that also uh, influences the filtration process. And then the storage time after the fermentation, let's say you harvest the things and you want to filter after that, yeah, uh, the storage time, where, um, it also depends because once you keep it longer and longer, perhaps there are other things that might present, yeah, either byproduct, so it would be more complicated, perhaps. And then the type of growth conditioning, the temperature, pH, and antiform. So conditioning is a stage before the primary solid liquid separation. So uh, that stage might also affect the filtration. Is it okay? Okay. So the types of filtration, there are two types of filtration, uh, batch filtration or continuous filtration. Okay, batch filtration, by uh, by nature, batch means like you just put the things, it happened, and then you collect the things. That is batch. Same goes to batch fermentation. You don't add anything, you don't take out anything. Uh, but sampling is different. And when you take the samples, it's not considered as part of the process. It is for the analysis. But uh, what is meant by batch or continuously is like addition of uh, media or withdrawal of the products. Okay, so please differentiate sampling. Sampling is not uh, involved in whether or not it um, uh, determine whether it's batch or semi uh, continuous or fat batch. Okay, so batch filtration uh, means that you put the things or the things to be filtered. You let the filtration happens, and you collect the uh, the filtrate at the end. Uh, so that is batch filtration. Continuous filtration means uh, you add the things, you add the solvent or the broth to be filtered, and the filtration process takes place. And at the same time, you harvest the filtrate, and you put again. You know that like it's continuous. That's why it's called continuous. So the addition and the removal of the filtrate is going on at the same time yeah so that's continuous so under batch filtration there are two types of uh, filtration the first one is cake filtration this one is uh, the one that you if let's say you use the filter paper you put it on the funnel right and after some time there are cake that are formed we call it cake uh, the fil the retentate yeah, the retentate will be remain on the filter paper that is that is called as cake. Uh, so it's, it's called cake filtration because at the end that cake will be formed. Yeah? Uh, particles retained on the filter, liquid flows through, right? Okay. Uh, cake formation uh, will slow the filtration rate, yeah, of course. Uh, so towards the end, it will be much slower than compared to the beginning. So this one is called cake. Yeah? So you can see the cake form on the filter. Right, uh, the second type is depth filtration. So the depth filtration, 
uh, the retented, the things to be filtered will be will reside in the filter. So for that filtration, normally cartridge is used. Uh, the filter is in the form of cartridge, not the filter paper. So this is uh, how the cartridge looks like. I think this is common for the water purification system. Yeah, you have certain cartridge inside and the water, the original water is filtered. It goes through the cartridge before it is uh, to be uh, before it is to be dispersed, right? Uh, so this one is uh, the filter inside the water purification system is an example of uh, you know, depth filtration. So what happened during the depth filtration? So this is the, the things or the feed. Uh, the, the things will be trapped inside the cartridge. It's not like the cake just now on the filter paper, right? The cake is on top of it. But this one is inside the filter, uh, inside the cartridge. Yeah? Um, so that is called depth filtration. Right, uh, there is very little or no cake formation, uh, so the filtration can be performed longer. So it will go through the cartridge, right? Okay, it's suitable for clarification of solutions with high amount of solid, yeah? high degree of turbidity. So the selection of the filtration and the filtration are the banyak type of filtration, right? So that that uh, to choose which type is suitable, it depends on the nature of your growth as well. Okay, whether it's uh, very turby or very viscous yeah? or less viscous or less turby. Yeah? Okay, that is batch uh, filtration. Okay, this is a comparison between that filter cartridges and surface filter cartridges. Okay, that filter ni dalam ni lah, is inside. Surface filter is the one like um, the filter paper tadi. Yeah? Yeah. I, I don't go... Uh, words by words, I just pinpoint the important points. Eh? So after batch, uh, there is also continuous filtration, which is very common in the industry. In the lab, we don't have this. Yeah. Uh, so this one, uh, under this continuous filtration, as I mentioned, just now, continuous is you add the feed, you collect the filtrate, you add the feed. So it's going on continuously, the process. Uh, an example of this uh, type of filtration is a rotary drum vacuum filter. So this is an example. The picture shows the rotary drum. So during the operation, uh, this uh, drum is rotating, okay? And the uh, feed is going on, it's, it's fed, and then the filtrate is collected at the same time. Yeah? So it's, it's uh, rotating, it's continuous, the process. So the drum rotates slowly, partially immersed in the broth. Okay, this is the broth to be to be separated, and it will be sucked towards uh, the drum, right? And uh, the vacuum is applied huh, in order to suck the things, and uh, the products to be re uh, the products to be separated will be collected uh, from from the drum. Yeah? Right. The trap products can be removed by water spray to rinse the cake or using a scraper knife. Okay. So that is the, the, the process. Eh? Right. Efficiency of this uh, rotating drum uh, depends on the speed of the rotation of the drum. Okay. Uh, because it is moving, okay. there is a certain speed applied. The depth of immersion of the drum in the tank uh immersion is the one here immersion the depth of the immersion okay this one uh the strength of the vacuum because the uh, the the things will be sucked and the particles to be uh, separated will be sucked so the degree or the strength of the vacuum plays an important role in this uh, operation and also the temperature of the suspension yeah so the temperature also plays an important role during this filtration Okay, perhaps if let's say the temperature is slightly higher, it will facilitate the process because it will reduce the turbidity or viscosity of the growth. If let's say the temperature is low, the viscosity might be uh, higher, right? Like, um, if let's say you uh, heat the things, uh, cook uh, something, right? I mean, uh, growth, yeah, it will be much uh, loose. The, you know, the structure, uh, the same thing goes to the uh, things to be filtrated. Okay, so these are examples of rotating drum used 
in local sago mills, right, for continuous filtration of sago milk. And the right picture here is at the lab, yeah? uh, in biochemistry lab. So uh, filtration yeah, is not actually just for filtrating fermentation growth. Uh, fermentation growth is just one example of samples to be filtered. Apart from it, it can be filtered for, it, it can be, sorry, it can be used for uh, other applications. Yeah? Uh, so, but here we just focus on the uh, fermentation growth. Okay, uh, cross flow filtration just now is uh, what we call uh, depth filtration or the one that is perpendicular. Uh, for example, if you filter um, whatever using the filter paper, uh, you put the solvent perpendicular to the surface, uh, to the filter paper, right? And at the end, it will form the cakes. So the direction of uh, the feed is perpendicular. Okay, I'll show it later. Uh, so here is a cross flow filtration. Let's have a look at the picture over here first. Okay, now, so this is keg filtration. So this is the feed or the direction of the feed to be filtered, right? And this is the filter paper or the filter. So uh, the, how to say that? The angle is perpendicular actually, yeah? Perpendicular is 90 degrees. Whereas uh, this is what we call uh, cake filtration. So another type of filtration is called cross flow filtration, whereby the flow, the direction of the flow is tangential. Tangential means salari, yeah? salari with the filter. So here, um, the flow direction is here. And this is the filter, the blue, uh, the one. Sorry, sorry. Right. Uh, this one is the filter. So it means that when the flow is going through, the filter is next to it, it will be filtered left and right, okay? Uh, that is tangential, huh? tangential we call it. Uh, and the opposite of it is perpendicular or the cake filtration. Uh, so that is in terms of the type of filtration, uh, in terms of the flow of the feed. Okay, let's have a look back at this slide. Okay, cross flow filtration. So this is the equipment or the filter membrane yeah, that has this uh, kind of cross flow filtration or tangential filtration. Um, so the, how it looks like inside, this is the filter. It is made from microfiber, yeah, like this one. So this is the things that will filter whatever the feed is, uh, whatever the feed that is fed into it. Yeah. Uh, the good thing about this approach is that it will help to reduce uh, the build out of the cake layer. So like uh, the cake, uh, the perpendicular one, once after a certain time, the cake will be formed, right? And the downside of it, it will slow down the filtration mm -hmm. over time, right? Because of the cake. Yeah? Uh, but for this one, because of it happened uh, tangentially, yeah? uh, so it doesn't build the cake. So it the process will be uh, more efficient at certain point, yeah? Because, and also if you see the length of the filter is long, so the, the room for the filtration is wider compared to if let's say it's just on the surface on the, uh, like the cake uh, filtration, okay? So that's the advantage of this uh, type of filtration. And this one is the microfiber, I've mentioned about it. Okay, so this is an example. Um, perhaps if let's say you want to purify your stuff, um, a, a lot of stuff, maybe you can use this, but if let's say you just want to separate or, uh, yeah, you, you want to separate for the sake of analysis, uh, maybe you don't use this in your FYP, okay? It depends on if let's say your project is about purification, maybe you will use uh, this kind of filter. Okay, what are the factors affecting or controlling the efficiency of filtration? Um, viscosity, uh, viscosity it plays an important role. Yeah, if let's say the viscosity is very high, then it will affect the uh, complexity of the filtration. It might it would be more difficult. And then uh, the amount of the solid inside. Okay, if let's say you have uh, lots of cells, then it would be more complex, the process, whereby perhaps you might want to change the filter in order to uh, speed up the 
later process of the filtration. Um, okay, aseptic condition must be maintained, especially in the filtration of pharmaceutical products. Okay, certain products might not be certain certain growth or certain products might not be suitable to be filtrated because it might interfere with the filter aids, as I mentioned just now. So in that case, sanctification is preferred. But if let's say it is uh, fine, it doesn't have any effect, even though it uh, interferes with the filter aids. So in that case, uh, the separation after the filtration might be another step that needs to be done uh, when you opt for filtration. Okay, so that is filtration. Any question on the first part? So just now we are talking in general primary solid liquid separation. So those are the possible methods to separate solid and liquid after the fermentation. Yeah? And we are focusing on fermentation growth, not other types of examples yeah? because uh, we are talking about bioprocess in this course. Right, any question before I go to uh, cell disruption and the rest? Yes. Any question? No, okay. Okay, okay, no, thanks. Right, so we move to this, uh, the next stage, which is cell disruption, okay? So cell disruption is only applied when your product is intracellular, okay? So if let's say your product are extracellular, there's no need for the cell disruption because you are going to discard the pellets after the centrifugation, right? Uh, okay, so the cell disruption is a very important stage for intracellular products because you need to break the cells effectively. So uh, the disruption, uh, uh, the disruption, it will depend on whether or not the process that you take to break the cells is efficient or not. Yeah? Let's say it's not efficient, the cells are not broken well. Maybe some of the cells are broken, some are not, some are not some are uh, broken, yeah, that will affect the uh, final product recovery. So it's a very important um, stage to ensure that all cells that you are targeting will be broken effectively. Effectively means the cell will to be not broken in order to get the things inside. Uh, the types of equipment used depends on the types of microbes used in the production, meaning to say that the types of the uh, the, the methods for disrupting the cells, there are various methods. Uh, it depends also whether it's bacteria, whether it's fungi, whether it's yeast, uh, and it depends on the complexity of the cells. Uh, uh, if let's say the cells are a sphere in size, uh, in shape, it would be more difficult compared to if let's say it is in road shape. Uh, so the, the morphology of the cells also affect the difficulty of the cell disruption. And another thing that we have to take into consideration why the cell disruption is uh, quite a difficult process because uh, even though we want to break the cells, but at the same time, we want to make sure that our product of interest inside the cell will not be affected by the disruption methods that we apply, okay? Uh, so we have to be careful still, although we want to disrupt it, but we must make sure that the cells and the products are not affected, okay? So these are examples of um, products that are produced intracellularly, for example, vaccines, uh, tetanus, meningitis vaccine. Uh, some enzymes are produced intracellularly. Some enzymes are produced extracellularly. So they, are, uh, they fall into both categories. Uh, other products are like recombinant insulin, uh, recombinant growth hormone. Yeah? They are produced intracellularly. Uh, right. Okay, how to break the cells uh, before that? What are the factors that influence the cell destruction? Uh, the growth stage of the organism, okay? Uh, especially when you are analyzing the samples, you might take the samples from different phases, from uh, log phase, from uh, stationary phase, and some from death phase. So those stages may affect uh, the disruption uh, difficulty, okay? Uh, in the log phase, it's much easier to disrupt compared to the stationary phase, for example. Uh, and then uh, another factor is the growth rate. Yeah? The one with high specific growth rate uh, would be much easier to break, right? 
Um, and then for the pH of the sample, uh, if let's say the pH is alkaline, it would be uh, much easier to disrupt. Yeah. For the cell size, larger size is much easier to disrupt compared to the small cells. Yeah. Because if larger, it means that uh, you don't have to be so meticulous to break the cells. Yeah? It's, it's easier. It's larger. And then for the cell shape, the spherical organism is tougher compared to other shapes, rod shape, bacillus shape. Yeah? And then the cell concentration, increasing um, the cell concentration up to 60-70% solid would affect the disruption efficiency. So it means that it's much uh, difficult to break the cells if let's say they are concentrated, the growth are concentrated. Okay, those are the factors that affect the cell disruption. Uh, the characteristics of the ideal cell disruptor. So there are actually many equipments or many methods that can be used to disrupt the cells. Um, but the general characteristics of those disruptors, uh, they might be able to disrupt tough organisms such as uh, streptococcus species. Okay, some uh, organisms, they have different level of, uh, different level of uh, difficulty in order to break. Okay, some are perhaps might be easy to be broken and some are um, tougher. It depends on the composition of the cell wall actually because the main aim in cell disruption is to break the cell wall. So the content, different content of the cell wall, it might affect the difficulty of the cell disruption. Um, the ideal cell disruptor must have minimum effects on the sensitive products, okay? even though we want to break the cells, but make sure that the product inside might not be affected by the disruption process. Uh, the cell disruptor must be easy to clean and sterilize, uh, auto, for example, autoclavable, because once you, uh, once you break the cells, you might want to clean it. So a good one must be easy to sterilize and clean. Minimum residence time, meaning to say that uh, the process might be not that really long because when the process of uh, disruption is long, it might not be favorable because throughout the process, the heat might be generated and at the end, it might affect the product of interest. So it, uh, the ideal one is it should be as short as possible, the time, the duration of the process. Okay. And also in terms of the cost, okay, uh, if let's say the process is uh, short, yeah, it will save the, the time and also the energy. Yeah. Uh, heat production is controllable. Okay, so during the disruption process is not, uh, sorry, it is inevitable. It is, um, the heat generation can be avoided. Uh, there, there would be heat generated, but as long as uh, the heat uh, production can be controlled uh, and does not affect the product, uh, it, it is still considered fine, but uh, there must be some measures to be taken uh, in order to reduce the heat production. For example, uh, if we use sonicator to break the cells, sonicator is one example of uh, equipment that can break the cells by giving a high frequency to the cells. So the samples must be put on ice yeah? uh, so that even though the heat will be generated, but uh, the presence of ice will help to uh, reduce the heat generation, okay? And then another one is able to operate continuously over long duration, okay? So that one is, yeah, is a, the, the equipment must be robust, yeah? must be able to, uh, to be conducted continuously, okay? So the methods of cell disruption, um, you can use like simple methods, like you use bits, you know bits? It's like um, this one. This is this looks like bits. It's like uh, like um, pebbles, pebbles, yeah, uh, small pebbles, uh, bits. Mm -hmm. So you put the bits. Uh, I mean, you you put the solution. Uh, uh, let's say your whatever the suspension that have your cells, right? And you put it in this tube, and you put the bits, and you vertex it. That's the easiest way, the simplest way to break the cells. So because of the collision of the bits with the cells, it will uh, perhaps break the cells, but it depends on the cells as well. If let's say the cells are easy to be broken by that method, then it is possible. But for certain tough organisms, you know, perhaps that method might not be suitable because 
This is the simplest method. You put the bits in the test tube and you vortex it repeatedly. Yeah? So that is how the cell wall can be broken. Another way is by uh, using chemicals by adding mild detergent to the cell suspension. Okay? So that could also break the cell uh, wall because the aim is to break the cell wall. Yeah? So certain, uh, perhaps maybe uh, ethanol, some of the chemicals can be added to break the cell. So there, there must be a reaction between the chemicals and the cell wall. Okay? So that's how the cell wall can be broken. And then a uh, mechanical method is by using sonicator. Sonicator is like uh, this picture on the right here. Okay, there is a prop in, inserted inside. Let's say the your suspension is here. Okay, Actually, ideally it should be, let's, because this one is not demonstrating for cells. For the cells, it must be put on ice yeah? because this thing, this sonicator, once it is uh, operated, uh, the, the mechanism is that it will generate high frequency uh, vibration. So that vibration will break the cell wall, high frequency. It's not just normal vibration, high frequency vibration. So that will uh, break the cell wall. So that's how the mechanism is. And it will generate heat because uh, the process might take a few minutes, like one or three minutes, which I do, depends on the cell as well. So throughout that uh, period, it will generate the heat. And that's why I said uh, for this one, uh, but it's not, it's not shown here. But ideally, your cell suspension must be put on ice in order to reduce the generation of the heat yeah, during the sonication. So this is sonication. This is one example of machine. Uh, sonicator, there are banyak jenis, ada banyak design and uh, model. So this is one type, uh, the one that is prop. So uh, other design might be... Um, different from this one. Tapi the mechanism is the same whereby it applies the high frequency uh, vibration. Yeah? Homogenizer is also um, homogenizer any high pressure, high pressure, high pressure uh, where the cells are exposed to high pressure and that's how the uh, cell wall are broken. Okay, for example, this is for the homogenizer. This is what happened in the homogenizer, homogenizer is a is a equipment that performs homogenization. So, uh, what happened is, uh, this is the design inside the homogenizer whereby uh, the cells, the, the suspension, the cell suspension are forced to go through this one a narrow passage, mm -hmm. right, where it applies the high pressure. Okay, so below that, see, the high pressure need that will break the cells. That's the cell wall can be broken, and at the end, uh, you will get once the cells are broken after the cell disruption, regardless of any method, uh, sonication, homogenization, uh, what else just now, uh, yang guna chemicals semua. At the end, you will get uh, uh, you will get a suspension of a suspension that contains your product, which is the content inside the cells and also the cell debris. So after, after the cell disruption stage, you have to uh, centrifuge, normally centrifuge, centrifuge the suspension and you will recover the liquid. Yeah? So you will get the liquid, okay, for example here. So this is the whole cell and then once you get the disruption, I mean, once you do the disruption, the cells are disrupted. So basically, if you see the structure here, you see here, this one is cell scan. They are the cell wall lagi. So once uh, it is broken, the cell wall will be broken. So there's no more pattern. There's more, no more shape. So the whole thing will be in liquid form. So after the cell disruption, uh, in the lab, you will centrifuge normally. So you have to collect the supernatant, not the pellet anymore. The pellet are all the debris. So your, pro your product, if your product is intracellular, is uh, in the supernatant after the cell disruption. Okay. Um, okay. The primary separation, cell disruption. I just want to show the go back to the slide that shows where we have to consider for the. Supernatant. 
okay, here, for this one, if you see here, cell disruption, uh, you break the cells and this is the lysate, right? And the solid here is the cell debris. Cell debris ni apa apa yang kumpul ni yang cell wall tadi lah. So you, uh, don't collect the pellets. You have to collect the liquid. But here you have to collect the first one. Here you have to collect the solid because it's the cell pellets. The cell the pellets the cells are in the pellet. But here the product your product is in the liquid. Uh, please make sure those who are doing uh, FYP and dealing with intracellular products make sure you. Uh, you target this, the right portion after the cell disruption. Okay, go back to our slide. So the next one is primary separation. Okay, primary separation at sini. So once uh, you completed the cell disruption, you get the liquid and you proceed with the primary separation. So primary separation is a stage where uh, where you do early purification. So that is the first stage of purification. Um, the aim is to remove the water, yeah, whatever the water, because the water are the main components inside the lysate. Uh, now the, we have the cell lysate because we have lysate cells and also other components like mineral salts or in the inorganic compounds, residual sugars. So these are uh, impurities or co-products that are also produced during the fermentation. So what are the equipments or major units used for uh, primary separation? There are a lot. There are membrane processes, chromatography, yeah, solvent extraction, precipitation, evaporation. Okay. So those are examples of um, examples of steps. Uh, it's not only, I mean, the type, which one is the suitable one? It depends on the product as well. Okay, uh, I don't go into specific, just for you to know that what are the possible methods under primary separation just now. So I don't go into detail for each of that. For the final purification, is another stage of purification after you get the, uh, whatever the things that you have purified from the primary uh, purification or primary separation study, you proceed with the final purification. So here you got your concentrated products, perhaps. Yeah? So you need to further remove whatever the uh, things that can't be separated in the earlier stage. So here, the examples of impurities are protein contaminants, uh, DNA. There are so many things actually produced by the cells during the fermentation. It can be achieved by a combination of several chromatographic steps. Yeah? Chromatography is one of the example of method that can be used to achieve uh, purification. Uh, and the quality of the product depends largely on this last process. Yeah? So it's a very important stage because it will determine how much purity of your final product. Example of method, solvent extraction, precipitation, and chromatography. Yeah? Chromatography is best on separation of the particles, best on uh, the reaction with the solvent with the stationary or liquid phase. So example of chromatography, one example is high performance liquid chromatography, HPLC. Uh, that one is, uh, HPLC can be used to purify and also to analyze your product of interest. Okay, for solvent extraction, this one is, uh, you use solvent in order to separate uh, the product of interest whereby you use certain solvents like uh, alcohols, ethanol, methanol. So your product will sit inside the alcohol or this solvent after the uh, process ends and you collect from it and how to remove, how to get rid of the ethanol is easy that you just uh, heat it at their uh, boiling point, then it will be evaporated and you get the, your product uh, at the end. Okay, so after final purification is drying, conditioning, and stabilization. Okay, so the name, uh, as the name implies, drying is removing of residual water so that at the end, uh, the 80% of water can be removed, completely removed, leaving only the concentrated form of your product. Yeah, and uh, for long shelf life, the products must be dried. Uh, normally, the one that is in dried form will have long, longer shelf life compared to the aqueous form. 
but it depends on the types of product as well. Some of the products can be uh, prepared in dried form, but some have to be prepared in aqueous solution. Yeah? Uh, but by nature, the 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 one with the one in dried form will have longer shelf life. Yeah? So the three main methods: uh, drying, uh, oh, need, uh, need types of dryer. Okay, uh, tubo dryers, spray dryers drum dryers, vacuum dryers, and freeze dryers. So this is spray dryer in the lab. The one that is common in the lab is freeze dryer and spray dryer. So it's a equipment that converts whatever the concentrated uh, suspension into, finally into powder form. Okay. Uh, like, like how you see the milk in powder form, it undergoes all these kind of drying processes. Uh, so it is freeze dry so that you get the powder form of milk. And that is example of uh, Nina in the food industry. But for uh, fermentable uh, products also, they can be uh, produced as uh, in a powder form, yeah? uh, the end product. So the dry remove the moisture. Yeah? So the, the presence of water, it can actually trigger the growth of mold. So that's why uh, it's not desirable to have uh, wet products. Yeah? Okay, so that's drying. And apart from drying, uh, the last stage would be uh, to add certain stabilizer or uh, certain chemicals that helps to preserve the product. Eh? Preservative, stabilizer, growth inhibitors, eh? stabilizer uh, to avoid oxidation or reduction. So that when whenever it is exposed to air, for example, uh, it will not be degraded because of the uh, oxidation direction with the oxygen okay and then the final part will be the con decontamination and heat treatment uh, um, heat treatment only for products that are insensitive to heat uh, it depends on the product as well some are some uh, those that are not sensitive it can be heated before it, it is to be packed uh, uh, the exam the common example is the food and dairy products. Yeah? Uh, so the process is called pasteurization, where the milk is heated and then it will be uh, directly uh, packed in order to avoid any uh, any any addition of microbes. Yeah? Uh, low molecular weight liquid products can be sterilized by microfiltration. Okay? Some others are sterilized. A weight protein, high molecular weight protein, can be sterilized by radiation. So this, this kind of treatments are to be applied before uh, the products are to be packed, yeah? before they are packed in uh, packaging. Yeah? Uh, but radiation is not suitable for food products, but acceptable for pharmaceuticals. Yeah? So different types of uh, this kind of treatment is also uh, depends on the type of products. Yeah? Some are sensitive and some are not. And then finally is the marketing. Um, Marketing, uh, so the marketing price, yeah, it depends on all of the stages involved before. If let's say it is intracellular, uh, the cell disruption things might be included. Yeah? But if it is extracellular, then perhaps it, must, it would be much simpler. And it would contribute to the cost uh, because of that unit operation, right? Uh, so the energy involved, uh, the materials involved, yeah? And also, uh, not just the downstream processing, but also the fermentation process. Uh, so the when when it comes to the price of the product, it it covers from the beginning to the end, yeah? from the fermentation, from the selection of the materials, the media for the fermentation. So there is a trend to reduce the cost of the production by using renewable materials like agricultural waste. Because the waste, uh, like the one that have starch and sugars, um, they can be they can be possibly used for uh, as a carbon source, and the cost is uh, zero actually. I mean, except for the transportation, but the cost of the material itself is actually zero. Yeah, compared to if, let's say you want to use synthetic media, uh, which is costly. So the cost of the media can be actually reduced if we opt for uh, renewable. Uh, materials. Yeah? So that's one of the ways how to reduce the cost. Okay, so I think that's it.
So in general, you can see that the downstream processing and upstream processing both are important to determine uh, the end product. And without good fermentation process, you don't have the products. Of course, there's no products produced. But without DSP, uh, you cannot proceed as well, although you have a good fermentation process because your products need to be recovered. Your products need to be uh, uh, to be separated from uh, other impurities, and that takes DSP uh, process. Yeah? So both are important, are equally important, and both are uh, in, uh, both are included like, in bioprocess. So when we talk about bioprocess, it covers both downstream and upstream processing. Uh, like me, I'm specializing in upstream in fermentation. Uh, I'm not specializing in downstream. So in downstream processing also, there are people who are studying all this stuff, who are doing PhD in centrifugation, for example. Yeah, you just imagine like focusing on special uh, centrifugation, like perhaps uh, on the design of the centrifuge or uh, optimization of the centrifuge. Uh, so there are so many things to be explored actually in bioprocess. So some of um, my colleagues uh, at my department uh, when I was doing my PhD in the UK, they are doing research in filtration, focusing on filtration, but they are experts in filtration. So whenever I want to filter my stuff last time, I just ask for their advice because they are the one who study about filtration. Uh, so each of that actually, there are many niche areas under bioprocess, uh, even under fermentation as well. Uh, some of us are specializing in just microbial fermentation, not in animal or plant cultivation. Like me, I have experience in bacteria and fungi, uh, but not yet into animal cell culture. I don't have any experience with that because it, it has different processes. It has different uh, uh, procedure and setup. Yeah? It's completely different. Yeah? So whenever you do research and you are focusing on that particular things uh, only, uh, it's, not, uh, it's, it's going to be like uh, deeper and deeper. Okay, like you are focusing, for example, FYP, you are doing research in uh, bioethanol fermentation. So you are, you know, you are later after the uh, project ends, you know something about it, but your friends might not know about it. Yeah? But when you do master research, PhD research, you are going deeper and deeper. Uh, so uh, that, uh, that is how the research looks like. Yeah. Okay, guys, any question? Thank you for your attention. So we have come to the end of today's lecture. So basically today we have covered what is downstream processing. Okay, so by right now we should know that bioprocess also have downstream processing apart from upstream processing, upstream need and fermentation. Uh, you have to know uh, what are the types, the two types of cell products, intracellular, extracellular. Make sure find out your product of interest for your research, FYP research, whether they are intra or extra, okay? Because that will determine your analysis. And then the stages of downstream processing. Uh, downstream processing is a huge area. It covers many stages uh, from the growth conditioning, finally to the drying conditioning and stabilization. So the aim is to separate purified products so that the end product will be uh, in the highest purity form, yeah? like 99% uh, ethanol, 99% glucose, for example, it depends on. Okay, so any question, guys? I assume that you guys are quiet, you understand everything that I delivered. No, no, okay. Dr. Mooney. Okay, uh, so with that, thank you very much. Okay, uh, so those who I, I recorded this lecture, uh, I'm sorry that I cannot make the lecture at eight o'clock because I, I can't afford to have a lecture back to back for two groups. Huh? I'm sorry for that. Uh, if let's say you cannot, those who cannot join in the morning, uh, 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 who cannot join at 11, uh, you can watch the recorded. Uh, lectures that I would post on Elite and on YouTube. Okay.